So what we're going to be talking about today is what is ROI, what is return on ad spend, what is return on objectives, and some things that you need to know to begin engaging in the conversation about ROI. We're hearing more and more and more of it, and um, particularly as we get into the digital data and digital attribution, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about what that is. Okay, so look, aren't they all the same things? It's a return on something, right? Return on investment, return on ad spend, return on objectives. First of all, if you do nothing but walk out of here with one idea, is that ROI is a financial metric. It's only a financial metric. So I, we can't say, what do you th what's the ROI for driving traffic? Because it's not about driving traffic. It's how much money did the marketer make to, s to advertise in your medium less his profit. So profit contribution always figures in to an ROI calculation. The marketers, how much does it cost to make the product, to make the ads, to make everything. Um, so return on investment is a pretty simple concept, is incremental sales generated by out of home times the, contribution, the margin contribution less at the out of home spend, right? So it's spend, profit, how many sales did they get? Return on investment is a selling metric. So if you're a, a salesperson and you want to demonstrate that um, there was a, uh, an effect, a, a financial effect uh, on for the marketer for advertising in your business, you can show them return on ad spend. It's relatively similar. It's easier to get because you don't have to know the marketer's profit contributions. You can just say, you spent a million dollars with us and you got $2 million in sales, so your return on ad spend is a you know, million dollars. So sometimes it's called revenue return on investment. I'm gonna show you all this, so you need to sort of get some of these facts going from the beginning. And then the last one, people use this all the time without really knowing it, return on objectives. It's not a financial metric performance or financial performance metric. It's, it's about the ability to lift almost anything, drive retail traffic, generate e-commerce, um, generate uh, web traffic, or um, television ratings, you know, the tune-in uh, advertising the networks do, lift awareness. All of those are very viable. KPIs and th important things that out of home can do, but when you express it, uh, it's a return on objectives. Your objective was to lift awareness. Your objective was to drive traffic. It's different than ROI because ROI contains the client's profit contribution. We talked a little bit about how to calculate it. You have a million dollar out of home campaign. You generated $5 million in sales. Most important thing we need to know, and the, client, the marketer will never tell you what their profit margin is, it, but let's say they have a 25% profit contribution. You multiply it all out, um, and it's expressed as $1.25. So they got $1.25 back for every dollar they spent in out of home. It's just straight up math. I was going to say algebra, but it's not algebra. It's a straight up math. So you can work, you can find average profit contribution. So if you find yourself in this conversation about return on investment, you're like, how would I possibly know what the client's um, profit margin is to begin you know, making a guess of what the ROI is? There's a great resource online. Um, one of the NYU professors has studied financial valuations of corporations, and he produces this um, uh, this uh, profit contribution. So it's 25%, it's 35%, it's 14% if you're insurance. So you can begin plugging numbers like this into the math to go and determine a return on investment. The reason this is important is that one of the things through our study that we've learned is that there's a big gulf in the language of the marketers and the language of the salespeople and the language of the agency. Marketers are all judged on their financial performance, so they're gonna think about their profits, they're gonna think about their margins, and because a salesperson is all about revenues, they're gonna think about you know ad spend and, and making the sales from their perspective. So this dialogue about how to sort of bridge these gaps between what a salesperson or an agency knows return on ad spend and what a marketer knows return on investment is a pretty valuable thing. 
All these, uh, this, this presentation and all these other presentations are up on the OAAA website, so you have access to them. So if, you have the, if you're a salesperson and you are trying to convince a beverage manufacturer to, to stay with the out-of-home plan, and you have your return on ad spend. So return on ad spend was $5. And you, know, you found out from that uh, NYU professor that the profit margin in that category is like 23%. So you just multiply it out, and that equals a dollar 14 ROI. ROI, as I said before, is expressed as per dollar spent, what do they get back in profit? So it's important that we understand how ROI is measured. Some of the biggest the most contentious issues in marketing today are, you know, what is the return on investment? What happens to a medium that doesn't return well? Um, how do you get it back on the list after it's been bounced because it didn't have a good ROI? You know, what do you need to know? So we very simply have this small overview of what a marketing mix model is. It's not that, but she's pretty, right? And it's not that either, which is fun. But it is kind of like this. So this is a wind tunnel, and this is a little airplane model in a wind tunnel. And you couldn't build a whole airplane in order to put it into a huge wind tunnel to see what's going on. So this model of this airplane in this wind tunnel will tell the engineers exactly what they need to know about the way an airplane will perform in, in an environment. Right? And that's exactly what a market mix model is. A market mix model is a simulation, a replica of the marketplace that uses really granular statistics to show how marketing and all the other variables affect sales. Right? So they correlate brand sales and media weight, and they correlate brand sales and media weight um, with a, here's a weak relationship where there's sales going up there and there's um, a spend on the bottom. And then here's a strong relationship where they're much tighter together. The two lines are moving in the same direction and responding to the same way. So all the elements of the marketing mix should be included in the analysis in order to explain weekly sales. Really interesting little things like weather, like trade promotion, like price, like retail distribution, as many factors as you can get to explain sales and media, in this case, out of home and television GRPs. So where does the data come from that fuels these models? So they, the modelers, we'll talk about who the modelers are, so you have some association with these um, company names, they get their data from the currencies. Everybody uses the currency data, so that's Nielsen television data, uh, but because there are some restrictions on that, people will use the old Rentrack ComScore data, uh, the old Arbitron data for radio, MRI for magazines, Geopath for, for out of home. So it comes right out of the, the currencies. The agencies are frequently asked to provide the, uh, the, this delivery data as well. And then the sales data, so if two sides of the equation, how much they spent, uh, and what kind of sales did they get? So the sales data comes mostly from the retailers themselves, you know, and people who have credit cards. CPG companies use Nielsen or IRI. And then there are other categories uh, that are covered in a, a company like uh, NPD. So whatever the, the brand is using as their sales data goes into this model with the media currency data. And the national advertisers use marketing mix models to justify marketing expenditures. Um, to, they guide reallocation from the less profitable uh, elements of the mix to the more profitable elements of the mix. So it's pretty important. I spent my life as an account planner, and, and when you discover that the, not, the mix said that print doesn't work, it's gone. You know, it's just gone. The client says it wasn't profitable. It failed. And, and what do you say? You say, mm, I can't believe it. It's fantastic. We love it. Strategy is great. Executions are beautiful. Too bad. It's off the list, and you can't get it back on without engaging in some dialogue about why didn't it do well. Brand managers own this process. They make all the decisions about this. Uh, it's usually done as part of an annual budgeting process. We're hearing more and more of people doing it more often than just one time a year. It guides marketing strategy, targeting, geography, retail channels. They can't, the people who use it use it for everything. And it also guides experimentation and innovation, rationalizes staying the course. In fact, you, if you wonder why everyone does the exact same thing as they did last year, it's because their results are pretty good, because the model is telling them that those elements were producing profitable responses. 
So we're the agencies in all this, because uh, it's, it's marketing marketers, modelers, agencies. Some of the agencies give uh, planning agencies direction. Some advertisers bring the agency in and give them direction. Some are much more forthcoming and they're all part of the team and they're an integral part of the team. Um, and then there's a wide spectrum in between. C creative agencies almost never come to the table, unfortunately, and when you see how important creative is and all of this, it's surprising. Some agencies just provide the media data. It's a really important job. It's relegated to the most junior member of the team. Marketers don't pay for that kind of value-added service, and so um, we found a lot of data issues because people don't know what they're doing pulling the data. And some of them do their own uh, modeling work, so they have their stream of insights on modeling. Just to give you a sense of the landscape here of who the major modelers are, Nielsen and IRI are big in consumer packaged goods space. They do all the modeling, they do all the data gathering. Uh, ad research giants like Miller Brown or Ipsos MMA is a big company. So if you ever run into, it's like we, we had our model done by Hudson River Group or New Star, those kinds of things. Independent, these guys tend to be independent, but global um, uh, data pro or modelers like Analytic Partners, Marketing Evolution, Hudson River Group. And they're all sort of doing the same thing, but there are some small tweaks to their approaches. But for in general, this market mix model as an analytic approach, studying the impact of the ad spend has been in business for about 30 years and it's a finely honed machine. Um, companies like uh, Analect and Emphasize are, are doing it out of the agencies. There are single source data providers like Nielsen Catalina that models, TiVo television data models. Uh, agent-based modelers, which is a whole different thing, but it's actually in the same area. And then the, all the location that you're hearing about here this week uh, also, also providing uh, ROI and analytic work. So why do people buy snow shovels? When it's snowing. That's right, people buy when it's snowing. So. If you saw this, this is kind of a standard thing, it's a cute little case study, but so January 1st all the way down to March, the end of March. So there's a baseline of the amount of, of snow shovels that, uh, let's say, Ace Hardware um, sells throughout the season, right? And so they estimate what the snow, they know that snow's going to drive it, and then they estimate what snow shovel sales are going to be year after year after year. Um, and we know that this model of when the snow, the estimated snow shovel, is, is, is sales are going to go up is because we can replicate it because we can see how well it did versus last year. So you get better and better the more you do this and the more you validate it against actual snow shovel activities. The way this gets manifested in, in the models is that there's a big baseline. Baseline is a pretty interesting concept, it's an important concept, especially as people start working in attribution. Baseline is simply the, the sales that you would get if you didn't do anything. You know, these are big brands. If Tide stopped advertising right now, they'd still sell a lot of Tide, right? For how long? Three years? Four years? Five years? That's the baseline. So most businesses have a big, huge chunk of sales that they're going to get anyways. So that all of advertising generates incremental sales. So the, in the incremental sales, how much of it was driven by television GRPs? It's one of those dark lines. The light blue line, how much of it's driven by out-of-home GRPs? The light blue line. How much of it's weather? How much of it's consumer promotion? How much of it's distribution? So you can see all these stacked bars. And again, this is uh, over the course of three years. Sales go up, sales go down, sales go up, weekly sales contribution. So that's essentially it, 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 is it. What portion of the sales are attributed to what part of the marketing mix? And it's expressed a number of different ways. Uh, in this case, this is a pretty reasonable um, uh, case study. We have about 8% of all the sales going to advertising. It used to kill me when I was in the advertising agency business. You would spend your life you know, just working so hard on these businesses and these ad campaigns, you think you're gonna sell everything and then you sell like three to four, we worked on Trident, 3% of sales were attributed to advertising in general, in total. It's like my whole life, I'm getting 8% of all these sales. So it's crazy, but that's the way it is. So most of this is the baseline. Um, 
contribution by medium, out of home generated 34% of the, of the advertising generated volume. Online was 24% uh, and TV was 12%. Um, if, you, if you reallocated that to make it about uh, heavy out of home, you know, you could see the ROI increase. Costs are a big factor in ROI. What did it cost to get there? In fact, we did something in Hispanic media, kind of interesting, Hispanic television. And, and they sell a lot of products when the marketers advertise on Hispanic media, but it's expensive. So it brings the return on investment down because they spend so much money to get those sales. So that's another part of this equation here. Let's talk about attribution. If you have digital boards and if you work in digital, you're going to get into digital attribution really fast. Okay? And there's a lot the world needs to think about with attribution right now. It's brand new, and I'm only bringing you a couple of ideas here. Attribution is a return on objectives measurement. It's not as close as we want it to be an ROI measure. It's not really an ROI measure. Obstensibly, it credits the media with the conversions that occur along the consumer path. Okay, so the consumer is, um, you know, going to end up buying something. Let's let's go online for a minute. So I see an ad on TV, and I look up the website, and in the meantime, maybe I click a banner ad for that product, or maybe I see a display as I'm searching around. The, pur the purpose of the attribution modeling is to assign a value to each one of those consumer interactions, each one of those consumer touch points, so that you can keep optimizing the ones that are working for the marketer. Uh, operates at the consumer level and at the transaction level. Think about a market mix model, guess what? It's at the market level, so everything is at the DMA. In this case, everything is at the household or the transaction level. Totally different data set. You have to identify the consumers where they are and what they're doing. So that's pretty easy in the digital ecosystem because you know they're on the computer and they're, you, know, you know they're searching and you know they are um, going to ESPN.com and you know they're going off to these other sites. You can track somebody pretty easily on the computer. So getting digital into there means I need to identify where the person is and, um, and who they are when they go in front of the digital boards. So again, it's, it's a digital framework, it's a digital construct, and it's going to be applied all the way through to the rest of the media eventually. There are some significant differences between this and market mix modeling we talked about. So uh, as I said, digital, uh, digital is driving the interest in attribution. Uh, and for market mix modeling, it came out of CPG 30 years ago, and they're still using it, it and because it's working. And the same thing about attribution. People are in love with attribution because if you can really see all the touch points that a consumer hits along the way, and you can assign a value to that, to that sale, and you can do it really fast, and you can do it, um, and then you can make changes and optimize almost in real time or in the same week. Um, that's a huge advantage to the way we currently do traditional modeling or traditional marketing. So that's the promise, and that's why people are in love with it, and that's why it will eventually go that way. Television will go that way when the digital television um, keeps going. So the purpose of a uh, market mix model is periodic ROI measurement. Purpose of attribution is in-campaign identification of the contribution of each one of the elements of, of the, the mix. It improves campaigns in progress. Think about that. That's huge. Um, mixed models are done annually. We hear more frequently than that. Attribution models are run weekly or daily. It's depending on the system that they have. Um, at, for a Bakker Mix model, we do um, at the DMA level by week, maybe by day, but mostly it's by week. And then on the data granularity for attribution models, it's exposure data by device or household. So it's really, really detailed. And how do they do that? With the web, web traffic, the servers, the cookies, the tag, um, you know, versus the media currency. So it's very, still very digital. Uh, strengths here, fast, granular, highly actionable measurement of digital vehicles and creative. Think about that. If it's working, it's working. You do more of it. If it's not working, you pull it out and put it somewhere else in, in near real time. Uh, in the strengths of market mix models is it's a really solid R ROI measure for all the elements of the mix. 
you know, we didn't talk about, we don't talk about baseline with attribution much. It's something that uh, has to be worked into the system, is to get the baseline, to get weather, to get uh, the competitor's behavior. Um, there are a lot of data sources that are currently missing from the attribution ecosystem that have to be put in there before you can use it to measure marketing investments. Um, and here we say, you know, there's a potential for misattribution when the digital footprint is incomplete. If you can't look at your Facebook activity, if you can't look at your Google activity, so you have everything else. What is everything else, really? You know, so getting a complete consumer journey in the system is going to help. Offline media tend not to be measured this way at this moment, um, and a lot of the other sales drivers, as I talked about. Market mix models um, are pretty slow. They're backward looking, they're based on three years of, ac of historical activity, and it doesn't really help you out on tactical planning. Should you be an ESPN.com or Bleacher Report? They don't tell you that, but attribution will tell you that level of specificity. So if we talk about attribution modeling for out of home, granular, fast paced earmarks of attribution. It has to be granular enough to identify the contribution of individual units and ads. Think about that, unit by unit, ad by ad, day by day time by time, hour by hour, fast enough to learn and make changes in campaign. So it, it's awesome. The promise is amazing. Some out-of-home companies are getting there. Mobile sourced retail traffic data and brand lift studies are useful KPIs. Uh, and return on objective metrics require some financial, some translation to financial value to make the business case, but I think we're all going to get there. Right? Because we talked about how to bridge return on ad spend, return on objectives to ROI. We'll get there. But this is a totally different aspect. Everyone's using it. Everyone's falling in love with it from digital, and it will come into our lives here. I want to spend one second talking about location, right? Location is very, very exciting. Mobile data coming into out of home measures traffic and impact of advertising investment. Um, you know, the brick and mortar stores, McDonald's, are all using mobile GPS or beacons or Wi Fi data to, to figure it out. And this is just terribly exciting. Um, it's a lot of the location KPIs, store, t uh, store visit, dwell time, all these new KPIs that are coming only because of mobile. Um, and a lot of them use exposed versus unexposed, the people who you know, were nearby this McDonald's or who saw this ad and then didn't, the people who didn't have access to it who went to the store. Um, and, a, and an attribution window, it's a really important time. So if I see an ad on my phone and I drive by McDonald's, but I don't drive by McDonald's for two weeks. Is that ad still responsible for me going to McDonald's two weeks later? I don't know. Is it the day after? Is it the day of? Is it within 30 minutes of that exposure to the ad? I don't know. All of those things are um, in play right now. So this attribution window uh, is a pretty important concept. Um, accuracy, reliability challenges, but you know, this is exciting. This is exciting stuff, and people will. This is where people say, "Don't let perfect be the enemy of good," and or whatever that is, and you know, like get started with attribution because um, the promise again is uh, in-flight tactical op optimization, which is huge, and it can be linked to some shopper data too. This is the whole realm of of big data and big data a uh, attribution. Um, this new data is really great for retailers and other brick and mortar marketers, um, provides insights into tactical optimizations um, and can tell you what's working, what's not in terms of formats and locations and creative. Um, it's going to be a little challenging if we don't have all the elements of the journey and all the elements of the mix. And I think my last slide on this is we have to be careful that we don't um, Hold on, sorry, that we don't um, use last click. So uh, attribution and digital got going, and everyone's like, well, let's just use the last click. What was the, the, the thing that they saw right before they bought online? Well, what about all those other spaces that they went to, the whole rest of the journey? D is that worth zero? And in, an, in a last click uh, model, it is zero, right? So, they've, it, so a lot of digital modelers have advanced beyond that. And there are different rules now besides last click or first click. Same thing. What's the first thing? I, now I saw an ad for TV. 
for a TV commercial and then I uh, search. So that's how Google ended up with these like massive search things because it was like, it was the first click. I'm looking for something, I'm searching for something. Oh, that must have precipitated this buy. So they've gotten a lot more sophisticated on that. And if we go to location, like the last thing they saw before they went to McDonald's, you say that that billboard did all of the work converting that sale, it's gonna leave the industry really vulnerable because that is clearly not the case. There is a path and this consumer went down the path and we're gonna have to figure out where digital fit into this path and where all the other touch points were along the line in order to correctly attribute what out of home has contributed to that sale. Still very exciting. So um, we talked about a lot of this thing about what is ROI, what's not. We talked about attribution. We talked about lo uh, location studies. The next thing I want to help you with a little bit is, so you're involved in a, a market mix model situation or an attribution situation. It either went well or it didn't go well. You know, what do you do under those circumstances? How do you get the dialogue going in order to keep your medium uh, on the list or get, have your medium put back on the list? These are six strategies for dealing with these kinds of results. Because as I said, what usually happens is someone said, we did a model and your medium didn't work. And that's the end of the story. And it can't be the end of the story. And I'm here to help empower you to keep the dialogue going. And you know at some point in your career, you're going to have a conversation about return on investment. When your results are really bad, your job is to ask a lot of questions, bring in a whole bunch of different data. And if your, job, if your results are good, you say, oh my gosh, excellent. Let me show you some other stuff I think we can be doing without a home that'll help you. So you've got to keep the energy going with the client. So um, we have six different areas where I think you can begin having a conversation. Let's just start right in. So if your model results were really strong, um, you say, Let's just start with the opposite, okay? So usually what happens is your model results are bad and everyone's freaking out and you're like, oh my God, what's going to happen? And, and so you step back and say, why was out of home on the plan in the first place? What did we think it was going to do? What was it supposed to do that it didn't do? Okay, so was it supposed to drive immediate sales? Because that's what ROI measurement is, immediate sales. If it wasn't, then maybe you need a different KPI, right? Um, was it supposed to drive traffic? Was it supposed to build brand awareness? Um, you know, ROI might not be the right metric in that situation, and you can begin having that conversation. Why do we use uh, out of home? Did out of home reflect the, did the buy reflect the objectives? Because that happens a lot. People, you know, this, the whole system is kind of disassociated from each other, and people kind of lose track of what it is you're advertising in this medium for and optimize against it. So did it reflect, did the target reflect the objectives? Did the format reflect the objectives? Did the location reflect the objectives? Like all the way through, did the plan, you know, manifest the objectives of the campaign well enough? Could you do something differently now? Those are the kind of conversations you want to have uh, about the way out of home was used because it turns out whatever happened wasn't working very well. Uh, Right. Yep. Right. We're gonna we're gonna talk about that. So data, how the model was working. We just start with this because it's the broadest one. Why are you using out of home in the first place? And did you do it the way you thought you were going to to do it? Now, if if you have the wonderful situation where everything's great. Um, you know, are there other objectives that could be met with an out-of-home plan? What else can you do since out-of-home was working for you? Those are easier conversations to have, and everyone likes to have those conversations. The negative ones that are, are tricky. The second one is I want to talk about there's some normative insights that you can pull in, some stuff that happens outside of your case in point that might open your client's eyes about those results. So maybe if you got a, a 1.35 ROI, so that's $1.35 for every dollar you spent, you know, that sounds like a really good number. Um, and, but maybe the client says, yeah, but it should be $1.70. Like, well, but that's a really good number. And they say, well, how do you know? So we're in luck because the OAAA has funded benchmarking studies of ROI contribution in a whole bunch of different categories. And they have new results uh, that ju they just recently revealed for 2018. 
So let's start down here again. So if your model results were weak compared to the norm, you know, the, um, I'm going to show you these norms. So they're by category. So in general, automotive does, you know, a dollar thirty-five, or um, you know, for this this medium does this versus another medium by category. So it's really nice to know if there's some other external benchmark and what can you do with it. Okay, so this is a, a bench marketing is a company that has done a lot of modeling for the OAAA. It's UK based, but it's based on US data. They built these, um, they show these norms based on 20 different cases in automotive, ele consumer electronics, food, drink, retail. And, and this is what they look like. So overall, uh, return on ad spend, remember, return on ad spend, a slightly different than ROI. But for every dollar spent in out of home, you get uh, close to $6, $5.97. Television is $6.50, so very close. And Nan actually, Nancy said this from the stage this morning. She said that the RO ROI of, of out of home is one of the strongest uh, relative to all the other media. Why is the return on ad spend in search so high? Does anyone know? It's really cheap, so cheap that it works from a, an efficiency standpoint. So this is nice. This is useful to know. Um, and they have gone deeper and deeper into um, return on ad spend. Remember, you have to calculate, you have to add the profit margin in order to get to an ROI. But this is really nice to know what, relative to other media, what our out of home should be. I just want to show you a little bit from this benchmarking study that the OAAA has revealed and is very excited about. Um, so they've uh, looked at a whole bunch of different cases because they're a big modeling company and they've got a million different cases. So they looked at them and their big findings that Art of Home can make a significant, um, in, a significant channel in the mix. And it's, it's, it's useful to increase spend in there. In fact, most of this deck is about what would happen if out of home share went from 4% or 6% up to 10%. And they, they work all the rest of the media math to sort of demonstrate the kind of impact on reach, brand awareness, um, and financial goals. Um, digital channels are decreasing in some of these categories as marketers become a little disenchanted with it. Out of home has a good ROI improves campaign ROI, uh, it can improve brand perceptions, and that basically that we should spend more money, that marketers should spend more money on these categories. Um, a little bit of an eye chart here, but let me just walk you through this. So um, this is the percent of dollars spent by medium, right? So we see most of it's television, out of home is in red. Um, radio is in orange, and then the digital numbers come in after that, and this is all by category. So this, this whole deck that they have that's really useful has a lot of these kinds of norms, so how much is generally spent in these media, um, and then um, this is the percent share of out of home over the past five years by category. Um, what's that big blue one? The big blue one is retail. Yeah, retail grocery, automotive. So it has a lot of interesting little normative things that it's hard to get your hands on when you're making cases. I like this because what they're showing is your current spend is 4%. If you have a low budget average, all right? So it's lower than average. Here's medium budget, and then at the other end is a high budget. So um, the average, if you could spend more on out of home at all budget levels, you would increase advertising awareness, brand awareness, consideration, the recommendation, re recommend this product to your friends, or and purchase intent. All levels of budgets could be increased to get you know double digit increases in those important metrics, right? So and this deck is very very specific. They go into every one of these categories and they show you a whole lot of data. So if you're ever sitting across a desk and, and someone is skeptical and you say, no, I know for a fact, even at your budget level, that you could improve your brand awareness or your purchase intent by increasing the share of money toward out of home, this deck will help you get that kind of thing. All right, that was a little bit of a, di of a digression, but it's an important new resource for everyone, and it's there at OAAA. 
So another thing, we're, gonna, we're stepping away from these norms for a second. We're going to talk about what did they model? Did they model at the format level, or did they model at the e industry level? They modeled um, digital pretty specifically. It's like website by website. And then they put a big, huge bucket called out of home into the model and see what happens. Well, it's not only not fair, it's not very illuminating. And it's difficult to diagnose what to do if you have a bad ROI or what to know to improve if you have a good one. So if you were targeting professional women with these kinds of ads and you knew that ROI was you know, you were losing two cents for every dollar, out of home would be off the plan, right? I mean, it's like it's a negative ROI, pfft, gone, unless someone's madly in love with it. But if you knew that bulletins were, gave a dollar thirty-nine, shopping malls generated a dollar thirty-one, the ball shelters were below a, a dollar, uh, kiosks were eighty-three cents on every dollar. You could begin having a conversation about what works, what doesn't, and what you can do about it, and how you can shift the money. But if you only look at out of home as a clump, you're not going to provide any insights. So if they broke out the plan, and you could you could reallocate it to the um, to the media that's working harder, that's working more successfully for the marketer, and you could deliver a more efficient and effective plan. And that's the idea. So fo formats are important. Not everybody does model at the format level right now. So if they broke out the formats, if you, if you go through this whole thing and you're like, oh, yeah, we did that, and you're like, well, shit. But um, you know, uh, if your model results are good, um, ask for more money. Good means more opportunity. Find ways to spend more money. Because a, a good modeling result means something's working. Um, you know, it's connecting with the consumers and they're, um, they're buying things. If your model results were weak, um, recommend or reallocate a plan, um, a second chance, you know, s push the, push the uh, medium in the formats that were working. Um, either way, have this conversation about what works best. And if they didn't break it out, you know, basically what we say is that you guys know out of home. Fight for the format you know works. You know, point out some elements might have worked better than others. Um, hypotheses what a better allocation would look like. Maybe do some tests and learn, which we love. And encourage them to model out of home differently next time. Let's talk about creative for a minute. Nancy was talking today about how incredibly important creative is in out of home. In fact, Two-thirds to three-quarters three of effect, of the effect of, of advertising on sales is in the creative. And yet very rarely is it modeled out. Do we understand the contribution of strong creative or weak creative in this? And creative really matters in out-of-home. I mean, it's really, it's big, it's bold, it's, um, you know, it's really strong. So if creative was broken out in the model, you want to know what that is. If it wasn't, and it usually isn't, um, you ca can ask some questions for you, and the, o and the OAAA, again, has some nice resources for you. Um, let's see, if your results were strong, you know, suggest how the creative strategy could evolve and recommend a bigger budget. Creative's working. That's what the model shows you. Creative's not working. Um, it says the campaign could be improved. You have to test and learn, okay, to increase the, um, the marketer's interest in the medium and get back on the plan. Because once you get a bad ROI result, usually it's, it's over. Either way, have a really good dialogue about the quality of ROI uh, of out-of-home creative. Um, and how does the creative you have on your hands rate relative to what you think it should be? Is it good creative? I thought the Tito's uh, example this morning was good. She was embarrassed by her bad creative. It probably wouldn't have tested very well, and the ROI would have been, would have been really bad. But you know what? They knew it, right? They knew they didn't have good creative on their hands. There's a testing tool. Nancy talked about this again. They've increased the number of formats that are in there, and there's creative guidelines. Some creative guidelines are, you know, pretty common sense. You know, d is it clean? Is it nice? Do you get the story? Can you see it? Does it have a big idea? All of those kinds of things. So direct people back to the OAAA creative tools. One of the last two, there's two more areas here of areas that you could explore if your model results are good or if your model results are bad. 
generally it's when your model results are bad. <laughs> but I don't mean to be so pessimistic. Sometimes you get good results, but usually when you get a good result, you're like, great, and you go home. The purpose of this is if you have a good model result, you say, excellent, what else can we do here? You know, how can we make it better for you? How can we grow this? So a lot of conversation about data. Models are fueled by data. They're fueled by really discrete little chunks of data coming out of a household or coming out of a market. Market mix models deal with accurate, as ran, highly disaggregated, and accurate data. Okay, it's just, it's input, it's output. And if that data is too smooth, if it's too um, aggregate, they can't see the effect in it. So what we're talking about is individual units and formats, creative execution, postings, takedown dates, lat long with audience data by week, maybe by less than a week, maybe finer. Um, any inad inaccuracies in the data reduces the ROI. And that's a fact. It's called this iron law of econometrics. So it's a, it's a big deal and it's important. So if your model results were weak, the out-of-home data could be at fault. You got to figure out what data did, went into the model. A lot of times the modelers are working really fast and they don't spend any time looking at what they got from the agency. They don't know what they got. Sometimes they have dollars. So if they're modeling dollars, national out-of-home dollars in general, and it doesn't do well, they're like, mm, well, because they didn't spend the time to get into the DMA level. They didn't spend the time to work with GRPs or audiences instead of dollars. And we've actually been successful in asking modelers to rerun the, um, the models with better data in it. It's a, pretty, it's, a, it's a pretty good area for exploration. What's the right data for out of home? On this side, GRPs are impression. Weeks, maybe days, eventually. At the DMAs or for an attribution, you know, at the household or the person level. Actuals, not planned. We, and, and the modelers sometimes don't know the difference. They're like, oh, yeah, this is, this is like actual. This is the way it ran. And then you look at it, and it's really nice and smooth, and all the markets look exactly the same. Well, that's not real life. That's not, you know for a fact that that's not what happened. In individual formats and with the creative execution level or at least understand what campaign was running when they did it. Bad data is working with dollars, working in big chunks of time, you know, quarters. Um, big chunks of geography can hurt. Planned, not, uh, not bought. And then working at the total campaign with, without breaking creative out. And this is a really important chart, and you should kind of have this, because when you get a marketing mix result or an attribution result, you just take a look at this chart and say, did they use the right data for this? Geopath is doing a great job. It's way on the way. You heard Kim's presentation this morning, way on the way towards coming up with finer, more granular data for marketing mix models and, and attribution. Um, they're developing more granular data that's going to improve modeling. It's going to improve the ability to see the impact of these uh, formats and creative um, by hour of the day, by day of week, hyperlocal block groups, uh, more demos, roadside, more formats are going to be covered with better, more discrete data. It's what the whole world runs on this kind of stuff. So data is a very, very important dimension of model effects and knowing about what model, what, what data went into the model can help you. One more thing. This is called the what else do you have section of this presentation. So do you have any other evidence that the campaign may have succeeded? And this is, will give you confidence to bring in any kind of value add study that showed that it worked in any way. Did it generate store traffic? Did it generate web traffic? How about awareness? Um, bring it in. Bring it on. It's not modeling results, but you know what? Your job here is to have a conversation that will help persuade the client to maybe give out of home a second chance. Um, might not be as comprehensive or as accurate, but it's all about getting this second chance. Uh, so we talked a lot about, I know that this is a long, heavy presentation, but I hope to have, I have instilled in you that if you have good model results, do what you can to uh, get the client excited and keep the momentum moving. Ask for more money. Ask for a different advertising objective to be accomplished. Ask for more formats. Ask for more creative. And if it didn't go so well, 
you know, you really had to do some dancing. And these are the areas where you might do some dancing and raise your, raise your hand and raise the questions. You know, what was the campaign objective? Did we measure it correctly? Um, are there benchmarks anywhere? They are with the OAAA benchmarking study that they did. Um, look at uh, specific formats, because that's going to rock their world when you ask them if they measure different formats. Creative quality, you know it, you feel it when it's good, it's good when it's not, it's not, and you're going to have to fix that, someone has to fix it. Um, what data inputs went in, and what other corroborating evidence there is about the campaign. I think this is my last slide. Let's see. Ha ha! You did it. So let's think about that. Does anybody have any questions? I know I motor mouth all the way through it. Yes, thank you, Alice. Anyone, questions? You can take the mic, ask questions. I have a question. So what are you most likely to be asked in the next couple of months? And it's, I think it's going to be, can you send some data for attribution, for our attribution system? We saw the programmatic um, panel here. So the sooner we understand about how out-of-home data is linked into digital attribution systems, the better off we're all going to be. And then we can have the same level of insight we do uh, as we do for market mix models over on the attribution side. It's going to be very challenging. Um, I think you're also going to be asked about the new geopath data and how do you use it and how do we get it into the hands of the modelers. I think the whole industry needs to start insisting that better data be used on their models. And the modelers will take, uh, actually Nielsen had better radio data and they were making it available to the modelers at this enormous surcharge. So you know what the modelers in? I don't care. You know, model with dollars. They don't care. You know, it's, that's kind of like, it's, it's, they want to do a good job. I don't want to say that they're, but they're very, um, they're concerned about cost, they're concerned about speed. So if better data is going to slow them down, they'll just as soon go with the stuff they have in hand. Okay, so, um, and, it, and it can't cost too much money because they're pretty much on fixed fees from these marketers. And uh, so it's a, it's a pretty interesting little area, but we have to get the better data to show the medium in its best light. What do I love about this? That there are so many things you can do if you get bad results. There's so many questions to ask. And the big companies all have experts. You know, they're all, you know, getting very good on digital, uh, they're getting good on attribution and market mix models. So you should have a team devoted to looking at how the medium is being evaluated and how your ads are, how your campaigns are being evaluated. And there should be some on-site experts for you. And the industry is really stepping up too, so I love that. Because there are a couple of industries that we work with where you just want to go, knock, knock. You see what's happening around you. And I think the OAAA does see it and recognizes the, the importance of better data, better training, um, resources, upping the whole level of conversation. Do I have any other questions? <laughs> right here. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Yes, uh, I come from Advertise. Uh, uh, Advertising Academy of America. So my question is, is there a, a, a new emerging uh, consumer behavior model you would uh, recommend in this modeling uh, methodology? Well, it's interesting. Most people are hooking attribution to a consumer journey. And um, so if the end of the journey is a sale, what did they do? What information sources did they use? Where did they stop along the way? And, and oddly enough, that's pretty unique depending on the category. If I'm looking for life insurance, that's going to be a little bit different than I'm, if I'm looking for jewelry or if I'm looking for preschools for my son. All right, so every category has its own consumer journey, and, and you can do that research by asking people to identify all the different steps you take when you're looking for information or who do you talk to. It's all the, um, so the, those are pretty much the, most of it is, is this consumer journey. It's, there's a lot of conversation about whether it's a funnel or not a funnel anymore, you know, coming down into sales. Um, McKinsey has some work on consumer journeys. Uh, you can do them on your own just by asking people. And that's the model that I think is being used, consumer models. 